Now, you own four rental properties at the moment, correct? Correct. And you're how old? 27 years old. Yeah. So let's let's unpack that because we've got 70% of people thinking they can't even buy one and here you are sitting with four at 27, mate. How'd you get started? Well, let's let's go back a bit before that, I think. Um, okay. And we'll start when I was when I was 16 years old. There was a five-year period when I was 16 and 21 where there was there was three things which were occupying my life. I was I was working full time, I was studying full time, and I was playing soccer at a semi-professional level. Um, yeah, right. And these three things were occupying you know 90 95 percent of my time. But that was my life for a, for a good five years. I call it the the earning and learning stage. Um, so what, what were you working as? I was just a, a pretty general sort of sales rep role, um, straight out of school, nothing too flash up. I was also studying a, a Bachelor of Business specialising in finance. I didn't know what I wanted to do, to be honest. I was just I just liked learning how money worked, um, hence why I went down the finance degree. And then apart from that, I was playing soccer at a, at a decent level where that occupied sort of four or five nights of my week um, and then playing a game on Saturday. So I was just nonstop doing these three things. And it was fun. It was enjoyable. It, w- it was good because I didn't have much time to do anything else, which meant I didn't spend too much money on other things. It was just these three things, which I was receiving an income from my job. I was getting a little bit of money from my soccer too. So you're so actually getting paid. Like when you it, say semi-pro, you really mean it. Like it was. Oh, it is. It's not millions, but it, it's but like it's it's, money. It's like having a, a part-time job. I That's suppose. Awesome. So that was there was income coming from the full-time job, income come from the um, the soccer. Combine that with living at home. Yeah. Um, and you combine those three things and, and my saving habits were very good also. So are yeah. you feeling like you're sacrificing then or is it just like, no, I'm enjoying this? It was probably a better second job than most people will get. if they yeah, when, I I say, when I say go get a, another job or go do this, it's probably, it was a better second job, I suppose. But it, it was still a 20-hour commitment per week. I would go straight from work to training, straight from training, and I had to try and study in between that also. It was just nonstop, these three things. And it was a five-year period where that was all happening. As well as that, my saving habits were very good. I wasn't buying anything silly in my, in my, in my teens and late early 20s. There was no fancy cars, no fancy watches. It was just, yeah, all about saving. It's probably instilled into me with my, through my parents. That's what I was just about to ask. Who told you that or not taught you that skill set? That was mum and dad? It was mum and dad. They always said, don't buy anything silly. They would, they would yell at me if I bought something stupid in my, in my younger years. I remember back in the day, I was into like a bit of downhilling, the bikes and all that. And I yeah. wanted this, this bike, which was a fair thousand dollars when I was 13, 14. And I told dad, I said, I've got enough money saved up. Can I buy it? And he yelled at me. He said, don't, don't be stupid. <laughs> okay. Um, what, okay. Why'd you listen though? Cause plenty of people get told that when they're younger, but most like choose the rebellious path. What made you actually, unless dad yelled real loud, but like old oh, school vlog parents. So you know, Todd, uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> a little, yeah. little bit more of like a, cause you, you got Greek background. Is that it right? is, it is. Yeah. 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 So okay. It's a bit of a cultural difference. It is. It is. I just listened to that and, but it was, I just wanted, I, from a young age, I wanted to, to build wealth. I thought at the start, save my weight was going to be the way I learned that probably wasn't going to be the case, but it was a combination of all these things. Um, a couple of jobs, um, good saving habits and delayed gratification. I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't buying anything silly. So the money was accumulating quite quickly. I was probably saving 80, 90% of my pay because I was because I was living at home at the time too, which definitely helps. So that was probably, yeah, the early stage of my life. Um, from 16 to 21, a five-year period. That was the, the earning stage, I suppose. And then the learnings and how I came about it was... In my job, I was a, I was a sales rep and I was driving around most days visiting customers. I'd yep. probably spend a couple of hours a day in the car. And at the start, it was just sort of dead time. I was driving. You can't do much else when you're driving. But then yeah. I started discovering the podcast and, and chucking a few of those on. They just started as generic investing podcasts. But then I sort of crept into the property space. Um, and why and why property? Why not shares? Why not gold, silver? Um, property was due to my age and the power of, of, of time and, and the compounding effect. In that, being early, I um, understood, understood the power of that with property if I was to invest in my 20s and having, you know, a 30-year runway ahead with that you can do and the leverage things. and compounding effect with that. So I, I started listening to the property podcast and I really enjoyed it and I became I became addicted and it was literally, I was listening to them for about two hours per day from from the age of 16 to 21. And you imagine doing something for two hours a day for five years, like become you become pretty good at it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what, what are your mates saying at this stage? Are they like, what are you listening to that stuff? Or are you kind of rubbing off on them or? I didn't really tell anyone. It was just my own thing and I'll do so it. So you're pretty private about it. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't sort of 
tell people what I was doing and why I was doing it. Probably a lot of people just didn't understand. And I didn't want, I didn't want any negative sort of thoughts going into my head. It was just, I'm on my mission and, and yeah, I'm happy to, I was happy that way. That's really impressive, man. At such a young age, you're already identifying how important it is to have that like positive focus, that the mindset in the right place is, is that mum and dad again, or is that something you picked up from the shows? or what, what Yeah, you it's a combination, yeah. Listening to people who had achieved more than me through the podcast and people with that have built 5, 10, 15, $20 million port- portfolios and, and their mindset learning that way. Mum and dad were great. And then during that time too, I also met my now fiancé and meeting someone who shares the same values, goals and, and wants to head the same direction you, is, is very important. It's just turbocharged everything. If you know Mario Kart, you know that little start, that no rainbow Mario start, yeah. that rainbow start you get when you get that and you yeah, go through, yeah. do, 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 through everyone. <laughs> yes. That's what it's like <laughs> when you meet some. <laughs> Are you going to put that in your wedding vows? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I thought of that. But. You're like my turbocharged Mario star. <laughs> so I met her at a young age and we went, I wasn't looking for a girlfriend. It just happened at the time, 18, yep. 19. We're getting married at the end of this year. Um, Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. So meeting someone like that just helped and amplified it all. And, and so, so what's your fiance's name? Esmeralda. Esmeralda. So Esmeralda, she's on board with you as like a, I'm sitting here, I'm kind of the cheerleader, like cheering you on, or she's like, no, I'm right next to you getting hands dirty. How, how has the dynamic work? It's a, it's a team effort. Yeah. We're both at it. Um, without her, this is not possible. And without me, it's not possible. So it's literally, yeah a team side by side. We, we can quickly sort of sidestep just a touch from your story, but I feel it's very much related to it. Any tips from people? Because I've made episodes on this before and, and I unfortunately had some relationships that weren't the best fit in my younger years. And I wish I got more advice around that from someone like yourself as well. It sounds like you've got a great fit now. I Unfortunately, it took me to my mid-30s until I found a great fit, my now lovely wife, Bianca. But what, what kind of things do you think is really important to look for in a partner to know that you're on that same level, like property investing-wise? Like what are the things that Esmeralda does that you're just like, Yes, this this woman. She's she's driven. She works hard. She's very successful in her field. She, I told her about sort of what we wanted, what I want to achieve in in the property space and and all that. And she's saying, yeah, let, let's do it together, type thing. So she was pumped from she, the very start. She was pumped. Yeah, we had this plan that we did put together, and it was simply, yeah, let's do it. So uh, we probably we met young, so there wasn't like you know we weren't eighteen and nineteen years old, and we're talking about what we're going to be doing when we're thirty. It sort of gradually just happened yeah, over okay. time. Um, where you start to sort of see what the other person's doing, how they're performing in their in their roles and how they are in general life at home. Um, it just sort of, it just happened over time, I would say, Todd. And how did you guys get comfortable with choosing areas? Because I know that's a big hurdle for a lot of people. It's just that analysis paralysis of like, where do I start? What if I pick the wrong place? How'd you do it? Yeah, and then, yeah, well, this all started here with the education piece and learning about that and what people have done. And it was simply at the time just understanding what, my, what the borrowing capacity was and filtering back from there. I knew I wanted to just sort of get as close as I could to a, a sort of major CBD. And Adelaide, Adelaide for us, we, um, we understand the streets, we understand the suburbs, we understand the sub. I'll talk, touch on it later, but the, the council and the zoning. And so it did make sense for us to go by elsewhere. We got, we got the sort of the market knowledge here, the upper hand. So yep. we, essentially just sort of went, okay, what's our budget? How close can we get to a CBD? Let's find something that's subdivision potential and we want something with a decent land component because we're going to subdivide this property at a later date. Okay, so talking about the budget side, with your first rental that you purchased, how much how much had you saved up all up from those those like real working savings years you were referring to before? It was probably, I can't remember exactly, but I reckon closer to 100, probably just under, maybe 80 or so. Shit, well um, done, mate. Yes, yeah. that's brilliant. Yeah, like I said, yeah, those, those two in- forms of income over that five years and, and living at home, it was accumulating quite quickly. So we went to the, the mortgage broker, as you do, and they said you can buy up to 400K. We got a purchase price of, of 400K. Okay. Um, and it was essentially just working out sort of what suburbs were, were around the CBD, which we could purchase a suburb, uh, a, a house for that much that was subdividable and had a, had a decent land component. And it was as simple as that for the first purchase. There wasn't sort of any groundbreaking data that we unpacked. Um, so just following just, that kind of tried and true, like close to the CBD, close or close to the water, that kind of it was mentality? For, yeah, it was for the first purchase. And yep. based on our borrowing, uh, uh, based on our, yeah, what we could afford at the time, we landed in a suburb 12Ks northeast from the Adelaide CBD. 
we had a funny story, not funny, but it, we, 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 as you do at the start, you sort of start speaking to people around you, a friend of a friend of a friend. And yeah, we got shown these apartments at Bowdoin, which oh, yeah. interstate listeners, it's, it's a suburb, a couple of Ks from the CBD. And they no, look, nice suburb. It's a nice suburb. Oh. It, it, it's all trendy. It looks cool, but it, there's a lot of apartments there and they got trendy cafes underneath. For a first time investor, I can see why you would, would go there. The rents are, are decent, but I had learned I want something with a land land component and obviously apartments there's no land there so i said to them thanks but no thanks and thank god i did because if i had invested in that it would have been a, a completely different story today I'm, i don't reckon you'd be sitting here with four i reckon you'd be <laughs> sitting there with the one still going like what did i do wrong <laughs> like, and good on you for actually doing that as well because i know that a lot of people and myself included i actually made that mistake first time anyone that's listened to the show for a bit will probably know the story but i, I bought an apartment it wasn't actually brand new may as well have been it was like three years old and i reckon i sold it, was it in 2016 i reckon it'd still be worth roughly what i sold it for back then like and i only made i don't know what it was 40 50 grand when i sold it like and i held it for 10 years yeah well okay. it, it, just, it did nothing <laughs> But the allure of the pool, the spa, the sauna, like it was so cool. And when you're 21 sitting on 80 grand, good on you for not looking at all that and justifying why it's a good move. Sure. You stuck to your guns and it was like, no, 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 this, this isn't my path. Yeah. And that was, that was just from the learnings from the podcast and listening to people and they're saying land appreciates, building depreciates. So why would I, why would I buy this apartment then? So the learnings came from all those five years initially. And yeah, we, uh, we, we purchased the first property. I was, I was 20, 21, 2019. Mm -hmm. And it's been an absolute cracker of a first purchase. Like yeah. that's just catapulted us into, a, into the other properties. Um, and can you tell us how, like, how did that, like you pulled out some equity or what happened? In regards to the first, how we did the first purchase? Or? No, more so into how that catapulted you into other properties. Um, the, yeah, you, you're right. The equity that's grown by whew, <laughs> probably 80% in, since I bought it. Um, the second property we bought, we, it was a combination of, of savings, but the third property was, yeah, it was a bit of savings, but a lot of equity from the first property. So without that equity, probably would have, that third property would have taken a bit longer. So even though you're getting some good equity uplift, you're still like you, you're still sticking to those savings habits. Yeah, we couldn't keep extracting equity all the time. Just, you need to service the, the equity that you pull out. So yep. we needed a, probably a little bit more income at the time. So we still had cash. We're happy to put a chuck a bit of cash in. It was a bit of a balance, half, half, half equity, half cash. But the first, yeah, the first property obviously needs to be your cash. We, we opted for a, we did a 12% a deposit, which means we took out LMI. Yep. The reason we did that is because a 20% deposit was going to be all of our money, whereas a 12% deposit was just, um, we had some buffer, some wiggle room there. So we didn't want to put all of our money into the deal. Um, we Smart. Didn't. So, yeah. Cool. And so when you're buying the second one, third one, mixture of cash, bit of equity, what are you still thinking strategy-wise? Because you mentioned subdivision before. Are you starting to subdivide then? or No, not that's just part of the one of the criteria. What we're looking for is essentially it. Yeah, we want an older home on a larger piece of land where 90 to 95% of the purchase price we, we're buying is the values in the land. What I mean by that is with the suburb we bought in at the time, 700 square metres was going for 390, 400k. So essentially we just bought this land and it came with a free old house on top essentially. So you paid like 400k for it? We paid 400k flat. You're yeah, right. Okay. Um, and we don't need the house to be anything too spectacular because yep. we are going to be knocking it down eventually. It just needs to be sitting there and I don't want it to fall apart after one month, but it mm -hmm. doesn't need to be anything too crash hot. We want 90, 95% of the value to be in the land. And that's essentially what we did with that first purchase. Yeah. I would say it was 95% land um, value in the land. And what kind of yield are you looking for when you're growing? Cash flow isn't too important to us. Cash flow yield, we can manufacture. So we can we can alter the the yield through these de, um, these subdivisions through a renovation. The cash flow isn't too important. That's just a short term sort of metric for us. And then once we are we're going to be subdividing all our properties. Once that happens, then the rents are going to triple. The equity is going to double. So the cash flow isn't too important for us at the start because that's going to we can we can change it. And so after the rate rises we've had, you'd be negative now, like negative the gear. That, you're right, that started as positive. Yep. Um, the rates went up a bit, went to neutral, rates went up a bit more, and now it's negative. We're about to knock it down and, and chuck a couple on there, um, and then it'll become positive again. So the interest, the, the, the yield just keeps chopping and changing based on the rate. So it's not it's not a sort of investment 
focus, I suppose, for us because we can manufacture, we can change that that position. Um, okay. It's more about just buying in the best possible location we can afford at the time. All right, and so so you're doing one subdivision at the moment. As we speak, that's getting knocked down, and two nice double garage homes are going on it. Yes, that's exciting. So that's that's already started construction, or more the split. Um, it's just literally getting knocked down as we speak. So we've signed the building contracts, and it's just a matter of waiting for when the builders are ready, and it's all it's all good to go. Very cool, man. Well, what are a few lessons that you've learned along this journey to build? Like, how, what's the portfolio value at the moment? It'll be sitting around 3.6. Okay. So to build a $3.6 million portfolio at 27 years old, there must be a few things that you look back on now and go, oh, I wish I knew that bit when I was at the 21 year old stage. I think what I can look back at is, is taking action um, was the main sort of point I, I, I can take away from our journey is every time we bought, there was a reason not to buy. There was people saying this is going to happen. There's doom and gloom and mm. this. And we had just had this bulletproof focus and we bought, before COVID, we bought in the middle of COVID and we bought essentially at the end of COVID. And there, like I said, there was so much news in the media, don't buy, this is happening, that's happening. And we, we just ignored the noise. You, you, you made me write on your board the other, the other time, Todd. And yeah, what said, did you write again? You said, write a quote. And, and the quote was, ignore the noise. There's, like so much, there's so much noise out there about interest rates are too high. There's in, um, competitions too hard. Borrowing's too hard and... We have ignored all that and just sort of had a bulletproof approach. And yeah, if we had listened to everything we heard in the last sort of few years around mm -hmm. COVID and that, uh, we wouldn't be in this position, position today. What gave you the confidence to do it? After that first buy, we sort of, we spent the next couple of years in between each property. There's been a sort of a couple of year break where we sit down and start saving again and a bit more education. The education prior to the first purchase was more property related um in regards to exact properties to buy and and how that all works and then the, it, the learnings after that first property was more money and and how money works and and currencies and all that and understanding what was happening during covid with the world and and money and if i can explain that yeah, yeah expand on that a little bit that sounds like that's a deeper subject there well before actually i go into that just understanding what we're doing with our money and essentially when you when you work your money when you work your job and you get your your, your income <laughs> get taxed so let's say you're in the 30 percent tax bracket yep your real estate goes up yeah but access that tax free so all we're doing is essentially switching our taxed income into tax-free assets okay yep yep what else we'll say is saving is good but don't save for too long <laughs> and what i mean by that is real estate has always gone up always but it generally goes up over time but your currency the, the fiat currency is always devalued in time so why would you be saving for mm, i see what you're saying and then the old, red, the old red brick home from 40 years ago, let's say, that those old red brick homes, they were, it was at its peak 50, 60 years ago when it got built. Now, 40, 50 years later, that house, that house and land worth 10 times more. Okay. So what we identified during COVID was at the start, there was this deflationary period where people were hoarding, saving money, rightly so. People were scared. They didn't know what was happening. Had no idea. Yep. They had no idea. They were sitting at home. They couldn't really spend money on anything. Mm. Um, and then the, that's not good for the economy. So the, the government kept printing money, printing, 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 trying to hand it out. Here, go spend some money. We need the economy to, to survive. So people were receiving, uh, <laughs> I knew a lot of people receiving their full-time salary, most of it. They're receiving some sort of COVID payments. And then their, their expenses had significantly reduced because they were stuck sitting at home. Mm -hmm. So their wealth was actually <laughs> increasing in, in some sense. So we identified this opportunity where, all right, so interest rates were already, already low at the time. People have got all this money. The, the government's printing millions and billions of extra dollars. What happens when the economy opens back up? Where's all this money going to go? Mm. It's going to translate back, back into assets and goods. So we identified that and thought, hang on, hmm. When, so when you say we, this this is you and Esmeralda or this is like you've got a few other people on your team at this stage? This is all of our self-learning, just listening to people who, who achieve more than us, um, people who, yeah, understand that it's all just self-learning online pretty much. There's amount of info out there. It's just... It's nuts, in, isn't it? It's insane. Yeah. It's insane. If I had my time again, I probably wouldn't have done my, my finance degree. I, I think about all the stuff I learned and I thought, hmm, probably could have actually done that. For free on YouTube? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's insane. So it's literally just all yeah. self-learning stuff, Todd. And Someone showed me a, a brain surgery video the other day. I was like, wow, this DIY stuff's getting extreme. <laughs> if you need to study to become a doctor <laughs> or an uh, engineer or something, different story. But in mm. regards to sort of business stuff, yeah, I think hmm, a lot of it's 
for free now. So yeah. it was literally just all self-learning, Todd, and we identified this opportunity when when the world was going to open up again with all this extra credit being um, produced. Booms mainly come from an expansion in credit. Mm-hmm. If you make money cheap, people will spend it. So that was happening during COVID. We're like, okay, shit, hang on. Once this world opens up, I think this is what's going to happen. So we bought a second property right in the middle of COVID where there was all this noise, don't buy, don't this, doom and gloom, and we ignored it and we went again. Done well for it. Yeah, and that's that's really gone up 20, 25%, I would say, just by taking action during then. So as far as the the learnings that you wish you had at the earlier days, it sounds like you what you wish you understood like how money works at a deeper level in the very beginning? Or not so much wish, but like would have benefited from? I would have. I don't think it would have changed anything, but just the learnings, yeah. I think that first purchase was was a cracker. I wouldn't have changed that, to be honest. Um, but yeah, understanding how the money works and that side of things and property, just that property to the side and just understanding the world and inflation, that was a very powerful tool I found. And that sort of, yeah, turbo charged a lot of things. Yeah, man, big time. So where to from here? You're, you're sitting on a pretty solid base, four rentals, three, three and a half-ish million dollars. Yep. What's what's the plan? You setting the world on fire, shooting for for twenty fifty, or you you kind of like pretty content with where you are? The plan was in our twenties to sort of build an asset base first. Um, whether that was two or four properties, didn't have an exact number. It was just sort of buy until we had probably capped out. Yeah, we have built that asset base now. Of it, it started as three, and then those three are all subdividable. So that three is going to turn to six. So mm-hmm. the accumulation sort of phase in our twenties has 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 just been on a, has stopped, and now it's all about just subdividing when we're ready the first one's in progress the second one will happen in a couple of years and then the, the third one after that will happen in a couple of years so the three will turn into six eventually we don't have to buy another property and that will turn to six we just got to essentially just renovate them so once we get that asset base turns into six and then we're just gonna we're gonna hold that and and let inflation essentially erode the debt we're not paying back any investment debt we're just gonna let inflation do its thing and 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 hold them okay so you you basically it sounds like You've got the base that you've been wanting to build. You're there and it's just expanding it. It's not about like creating this gigantic portfolio. Like, no, we've, we've, we're kind of there. Now it's just about developing what we've got. It is yeah, developing what we've got. And then from there, who knows, there'll be a bit of equity in there. And we, we can go again or we can transfer into other assets like commercial, but we're definitely keen to build a, a nice residential base Yep. Um, in our 20s. And the decades we, had a, we have in front of us, the compounding on that is going to be really healthy. We just need to cash flow that debt, and the debt might seem another twenty year old might think you're crazy, but in we're just going to let we need to cash flow that debt, and then inflation will erode that debt. What that value is now, it's going to be it's going to seem a lot significant in 10, 20, 30 years. Let me tell you that. Did, did you ever read through like the Australian Property Investor magazines, stuff like that? Briefly, I Briefly. sort of caught the end of that. I think it's it's funny. I've got a, a huge stack of them from like twenty. 12 2015 all around there because i used to just read all this stuff and i never did anything um and i remember reading through a few people's portfolio and i was like wow look at this superstar 1.4 million dollar portfolio and you're looking at it and you're like well, that's good but like okay it's pretty modest but it's because like the comparison to, to what's that now 15 years ago that was still like four or five rental properties for for some like that was that was pretty good and I look at it the same kind of way as back then. You'd look at it and be like, oh, wow, yeah, but you've got like a million dollars worth of debt. That's crazy. But it's yeah. it's relative to a certain extent. And I feel that's kind of what you're saying, that you sitting down in 20 years' time, if you're not paying back the debt, it's it's going to feel insignificant in comparison to what the value is potentially going to be. It's hard, and it, You're right. And it's hard to conceptualize these big numbers because if I can explain the inflation piece, uh, let's say – I think the average Australian income, uh, weekly income is 900 and something now. It was 520 in 2010. So you can see that jump there already. But mm-hmm. let's just say you bought a, a property for half a million dollars, 500K, mm-hmm. and your debt's 400K, mm-hmm. and your income is 100K. Mm-hmm. So debt 400, income 100. You're leveraged four times to that debt. Okay, mm-hmm. not ideal, not the worst, not the best. Fast forward 10, 15 years, property goes to a million dollars. Debt's still 400. Now your income's 200. Okay. Now you're only leveraged two times to the income, mm-hmm. uh, to the debt. Sounds better. 15 years again, property's two mil. Debt's still 400. Income's now 350. Okay. That's pretty good. Mm. But it's hard to conceptualize these big numbers because if you say income 350, people say, well, 
It you're sounds in, absurd. You're on drugs. Yeah. But it's all relative because a can of Coke's going to be ten dollars by then too. So yep. it's 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 hard to conceptualize these big numbers. It will happen eventually. Just like mum and dad's property, they bought for three four hundred k now it's worth a couple of mil. Did they ever think that was going to happen? Yeah, you, you think about it now, like what what they would have paid back in the I don't know how old your parents are, but in the seventies, yeah, fifties. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Like, um, I was like in the fifties or they are they in are the fifties. Oh, they're, they're, okay, <laughs> well, yeah. different story then. Um, but yeah, that they, they would have been basically what we'd spend on just quickly nipping to the shops would have been a mortgage repayment for them back then. Exactly. So it's all relative. Yeah, it's hard to conceptualize these big numbers, but it it, it will happen. Yeah. Well, as as far as advice is concerned for anyone else in their early 20s kind of circling back to this whole like 70 percent like it's it's massive for all of the younger people that think i can't even get one what do you what do you think they should be doing thinking reading to just get out there and do it because it's obviously possible man like you, you've done it yeah yeah i would stay by start don't your first property isn't going to be a 10 out of 10 bloody mansion in wherever it's don't don't look at like where your parents live and then think i want my first property i want to buy around this area because the reality is that's probably your parents second or third property so be yeah. realistic and invest where you, it's your first property like you're in your 20s like it's not going to be your forever home mm-hmm. understand that piece um so kind of lower the standard almost yeah but yeah just <laughs> yeah in regards to the the education piece which was huge in my beginning years understanding that and I spent so much time researching the market and that allowed me to make a, a good decision your first property. You want to get your first property right. If you get that wrong, not the end of the world, but it will delay things. Um, and when you say getting it wrong, that's kind of like the, the Bowden unit reference? Yeah, exactly. It wouldn't have been the end of the world, but it just would have slowed things down. Yep. Um, I will say though, in your 20s, just just essentially go for it. Like <laughs> Your 20s is when you've got your most energy, your most time. You're not going to... You're not going to die in your twenties from working too hard. So yep. I would say just just ignore the noise and 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 work your guts out. I would, yeah. How, yeah. how many hours a week would you, do you reckon you'd be doing? Those earlier years, it was literally just going from work to to soccer training to, and then trying to study full time in between. I was out from nine to eight to eight, literally twelve hours a day. But yeah, so you, you you weren't going to to Red Square and you weren't hitting up the clubs the same way. Oh, I did a couple of sessions, Todd, but. <laughs> <laughs> but that that wasn't an every but weekend. It wasn't, thing no, it wasn't okay. every weekend. They're okay. actually closing this week or something. I heard. Yeah, about I, that. I saw that on Facebook. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's that's a different. That's a whole different podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you're smashing it out. So basically, uh, lower the standard probably isn't the way to put it. But maybe just don't don't shoot for the stars on the first one. Just get something that's maybe a bit more modest. Work your guts out. Is there anything else? The whole, the income piece you need to be, saving is all well and good, but you're not going to build wealth from saving $4 on a cup of coffee every day. You need to, you need to be continuously increasing your income, whether that's improving your income in in your day job or a day job, or it's a second income, that that income needs to keep growing and growing and growing. The moment that becomes stagnant for too long, Mm -hmm. that's when your investing journey will also stop with it too. That's, that's a big piece because properties are ultimately a game of finance and, you need to keep working on that. So working on your skills to increase your, yeah, which will lead to you getting better at your job, which will lead to pay increases, promotions. That's a big piece too. And I'll say that's more important than actually saving is increasing your income. For anyone that thinks I'm in a job, I can't do it. I get my 60 grand, 100 grand, whatever it is. What do you say to that? It's either, yeah, you're, either, you're limited to either you increase your the job that you got, you increase the income there, or it's a second income or... It's a completely different job where you can alter your income. I got a job in sales, which is a great first job. It wasn't a, a, a job where I was capped at income. The harder I worked, mm-hmm. the better I was at my job, the more I got paid. So jobs like that are really good, I find, where you're not you're not sort of stuck within this this confinement of no matter how hard and how good you are, you, you just get paid the same. It's so, real like performance base. Yeah, uh, that's all. that was my job and it still is. And the harder I work, the more I get paid. Yeah, because if you're a teacher... If you're the best teacher in the world or the worst teacher in the world, you still get paid as a teacher. Yeah, then you probably have to go down a, a sort of second um, revenue route. Yeah. Okay. I like that, man. And is there, I feel like we've kind of put it into the action step category there, but is there any kind of an action step you've got for someone that's been really inspired by this? They're in their 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever it is, and they're like, I like what this dude's talking about. What's something they can pull out the headphones and put into action straight away? I think it's just, yeah, the education, Tom. Um whether that's literally just 
your form of whatever you like. I'm, I was a podcast guy, so and I spent so much time driving, so podcasts made sense to me. Whether you like books, podcasts, whatever that is, but you need to you need to be the education piece is the most important when you start. People think they're going to read two books and they're going to buy their first property. Like, really, come on, it's your biggest financial decision of your life. Put some time and effort into it. Um, People do do that though as well. When I was an agent. <laughs> I'd meet people that had like read one book and thought they were experts. So I completely echo what you're saying there, man. I think that's very solid advice. Or you can now. There's there's BAs out there, and you can uh, you can hire other people's True. services to to yep. help you. Um, so you can go down that route. But just having your own knowledge, you, you can't beat that. So that's my word of advice. Love it. And Zach, I have to ask you arguably the most important question of the entire show. What is your favorite pizza? Well, I was in Italy last year and there was some absolute cracker pizzas there. But if I'm just going to stay locally, um, my cousin-in-law actually, he's got one of those Gosney homemade. It's a pretty serious setup. Yeah. Um, homemade pizza. Like wood fire? Wood fire. And he, oh, yeah, he cooks yeah. some crazy some crazy pizzas in there. So shout out to Adrian. I'll be over Friday night, 7.30, one margarita. And Adrian, that, I'll be over too, mate. One <laughs> mushroom, please. <laughs> <laughs> so margarita and a mushroom. You've got two favourites. And a meat lovers. Make it three. Oh, three. Okay, getting greedy, but all right. <laughs> mate, I love it. Thank you so much for jumping on the show, mate. Are there any final words of wisdom or anything that you'd like to leave everyone with today? Ignore the noise and go for it. Love it. Thank you so much, Zach.